Well, greetings, everyone. Um, it's exciting to be back with you today as I'm teaching uh, the class Understanding the Forerunner Call. And in this session, we want to, is session three, we want to be talking about turning people to Christ. That's the title of the session, the theme of the session. I hope you're enjoying the uh, this class. Uh, I've really enjoyed writing it and teaching it. It's something that's been really on my heart for a number of years uh, to uh, just be able to really communicate that idea of the call of the forerunner and the spirit and the power of Elijah. So I hope you're enjoying it as much as I enjoyed preparing it. I do want to just kind of reiterate, we've talked about this in other sessions and in the notes, but I do want to really reiterate to you, if you're taking this class, especially if you're part of the Forerunner School and taking this class, I want to really encourage you to dig into the notes, uh, study and read, look up the scriptures, meditate on them. Don't just rush through it. You can read a set of a, a session notes in probably 15, 20 30 minutes, but you won't gain any, uh, glean anything from it unless you really dig into it. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to listen to the audios, watch the videos, uh, podcasts where those are available uh, on the topics, and just really dig into it and get it into your heart because forerunners have to have this message uh, deep into their heart if they want to really be used as forerunners in this generation. And there's certainly a need uh, to for forerunners to be raised up in America and really around the world. Uh, there is uh, no accident that God is saying in this hour uh, it's time for forerunners to arise in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So I uh, just want to encourage you with that. Um, what we're going to do in this session is we're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. In fact, we're going to look at that uh, scripture verse in detail this session the next session and then session five also uh, as it really is the foundational uh, scripture that we use to define and to explain the forerunner call if you remember just a little bit of a review if you remember that in session one we talked about the days of elijah and we looked at elijah and john the baptist ahab and jezebel and compare that to, to, to the fact that we're living in days much like the days of John the Baptist and the days of Elijah. So we looked at that to set the stage for the need for forerunners to arise in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Uh, and then in the uh, last, se last session, session two, we dealt with the idea that the forerunner call that we're talking about is specifically the call to end time forerunners. There have been forerunners all throughout history, uh, even going back to Noah, and throughout the Old Testament and John the Baptist and throughout the church age, there have been forerunners throughout to bring in new truths and new ideas. But what we're saying, we believe, that the scriptures teach that there will be end-time forerunners who will be, whether it's a few years, a few decades, or a few generations, whatever it is, this anointing will be in the church uh, until the Lord returns. It will ultimately usher in uh, the second coming of Christ. So we're talking about end time forerunners that God is raising up in this hour. Uh, and so with that background, we want to get now into looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Now let me just start with prayer, and then we'll get into uh, dealing with an aspect of that in this session. Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to speak on this. We do pray, Father, that you would pour out your spirit upon it. Lord, I do just confess that I am merely an earthen vessel and I ask for your voice to come through with boldness and with a teaching anointing and one that can really articulate the truth that you want to speak to these who we know hunger for you and thirst for you and desire to be used of you in these last days. So we say welcome, Holy Spirit, take control now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's, let's start by reading this uh, two, two scripture verses that we're going to be talking about uh, over the next few sessions. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I'm reading from the New American Standard Translation, uh, and it says, He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Talking about John the Baptist, he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And that's what we're going to actually be looking at in this session, that phrase, turn many back to the Lord their God. For it is he who, go, who will go as a forerunner 
before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous uh, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we're going to look at the, in this session, we're going to look at turning back, turning people back to the Lord or back to Christ. Uh, in the next session, we'll be looking at this phrase, make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And then in session five, we'll look at the spirit and the power of Elijah. So we'll, we want to come now and, and begin to talk about turning people back to Christ. But before we do that, let's make sure we understand the definition of, uh, of a forerunner. We want to explain the forerunner uh, call. Uh, if you look at Elijah, you look at John the Baptist, you look at forerunners, you see that what they do is they go before and then they bring others along with them. That's kind of the overall brief definition of a forerunner, the one who goes before others and then brings uh, others along with them. And, and we see this in the scriptures. That's, you know, some of the scriptures we've used in prior sessions, like, for example, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. Uh, it says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is, this is Isaiah speaking about John the Baptist's ministry because it's confirmed in the New Testament. But it's also, like we talked about in the last session, it's also a reference to uh, forerunners in the last days to make ready a people in the end times as well. But it says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So you see that idea of preparing the way or going ahead and bringing others by making the rough places smooth. The bringing down the, the opposition, the high places, and raising up the low places so that our people are prepared for the coming of the Lord. So you see that in Isaiah. We see it also in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Again, we see that preparing the way before him. In other words, going ahead of him to prepare the way. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But again, you see this uh, Malachi's prophecies. He's prophesying about John the Baptist as well as end time forerunners. They go before the Lord to prepare the way uh, for his coming. And then one New Testament verse, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In those days, John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And so what did he do? He went before the Lord, before the earthly ministry of Christ. He went before him. Uh, and, and he prepared the way. He went and he said, repent. In other words, turn back uh, to Christ and, and uh, prepare the way. So we see, the, we see this idea of going ahead and, you know, we begin to look at definitions. Now, if we look at the English definition of the word forerunner, uh, we see it's, here's the English definition. It's somebody or something that brings news of or is an indication of what is to happen. Uh, the second meaning is somebody who or something that goes ahead of others. And, and both of those meanings in the English really apply to the forerunners that we're talking about. They, uh, they, they go and they bring news or an indication of what is going to happen. You know, we'll talk about this um, uh, in other sessions, but, they're, they, you know, to make people alert to what's going on, what's going to be happening uh, based on the scriptures and based on what's going on in the uh, around in the world, just, you know, the chaos that is happening uh, in many places and, and will continue to be spurts and seasons, birth pangs of this uh, for years and decades. What we, we see is that in this definition, that they bring news of that or indication of what's going to happen so that people can be made ready. A, a second meaning is to go ahead of others. Now, we see in the Greek... Uh, this, the definition of the word forerunner, this, a similar type of idea. Now, I want to make sure you understand that the only place that the word that is translated forerunner in English 
appears is in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20, and it's speaking about, about Christ, about Jesus going as a forerunner uh, before us into, the, into heaven, into the throne room uh, of God. Uh, so that word that is used there is prodromus uh, in uh, Kittle's um, dictionary uh, says this, which is a you know, well-respected theological dictionary, says that the word mean, means running before and is used of messengers and also in athletics and sailing. In Hebrews 6.20, the idea is not so much that of an, of an onrushing warrior or an advancing ship, but more like the one who has run the same course and whose successful running makes that of believers possible. Uh, and that's an aspect of the forerunner call. We have to run that course ourselves and then to make possible the way for others uh, to come. Uh, so we see that in the Greek and the English uh, definitions of the word. Now, if you look at Luke chapter 1, verse 17, uh, where it says that he will go as a forerunner, I want you to make sure you understand this. The word forerunner is not actually uh, in the original language there. It's, it's added by the editors to explain two other Greek words that are in that passage that mean that. So it's, it's a way of amplifying. And then you, if you look at different translations, a lot of them you won't really see the word forerunner. The New American Standard adds that. And I, I think it adds a, a real clarity to it. I think it's important and it helps simplify it. Uh, but I want to make sure you understand that it's not even it's not actually in the original language there. But it 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 combined the meaning of that is combined in two words that are used uh, in that passage, and uh, they are uh, I'm horrible at pronouncing Greek words. But uh, proer komei, I know that's r really butchering the the actual word, which means to go before or to go onward or to proceed in a place or, in a place or time. And the second word is uh, inopion, which means to go before. So, you know, you see the idea of going uh, before. Um, and that's what for end-time forerunners are to do. We are to go before. God, by his grace, is raising up a company of forerunners who he is giving uh, discernment of the times and the seasons. He's giving revelation of the scriptures as, re as it relates to uh, how people need to get ready to be prepared for the Lord's coming. He's giving this insight to it, and he wants to expand this number uh, of people. But he, what he wants to do is for that group who he's graced with in a, in a, in a unique way, uh, a way which certainly for the times and the seasons, to go before and to bring others along. Uh, with it. It's not just to get this information just for yourself. It's to be a messenger, to be a builder, to be a voice. And we'll talk about more about that in, in, in later sessions. Um, so that's what they're to do, to announce and to invite, to confront, to birth, to start, to build, you know, to plant, all kinds of different ideas you could use. But that's what the call of a forerunner is. So let me just give you uh, the definition that we've come up with. Uh, this is our definition. It's in the notes, but I'll read it. Uh, that an end-time forerunner is one who will embrace a fresh understanding of end-time teachings. Now, that is a real, uh, real need uh, in today's uh, church because there's a lot of error as it relates to end-time teachings. We'll get a fresh revelation, which we believe is an accurate interpretation of end-time teachings, Press in with a deep and determined attitude to the purposes of God being revealed to this generation. Now, we'll be talking some about that in, in this session and the next. Uh, press into those things so that they're real in your life. You own them and you live them in your own uh, life. And then begin to live in the reality of these distinctives. We have, forerunners can't just be a voice telling people to do stuff that we're not doing. There's only the only way there's life in it is if we are living it, if we are pursuing it, if we are uh, wanting it and desiring it. Uh, so to press into those things, and then to minister to the larger body of Christ and to the world to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, so as to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. That's a long definition, but I think you get the idea. So people 
who go before the Lord and before his coming to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. With fresh revelation, a, ha- a hunger and a thirst for God, a burden for the state of the church and uh, many other aspects uh, of this. And we'll talk more about all that in, in some later sessions. But right now we want to talk about the, the purpose of this session is turning people to Christ. Remember uh, from that Luke 1, 16 and 17, especially this is really, this message is really about verse 16. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That's the part of the forerunner call to turn people back to the Lord their God. And we want to just define it, refine it this way, to turn people to Christ, to, the, to, to Christ. That's the objective of the forerunner call, to turn people uh, back to Christ. And you, when you see that, uh, you see it with the call on John the Baptist. You see it with the call on Elijah's life. Remember when Elijah went to confront the prophets of Baal and the Asherah, the prophets of Asherah, and, and the people were there. He had gathered all the people. And here's what he said. Uh, he came near to all the people, and he said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And what was he saying? He was saying, I'm, in a sense, he was saying, I am calling you, I am calling you to turn back to Yahweh. I'm calling you to turn back to the Lord your God. You've been in compromise or you've been totally worshiping at the altars of Baal and the Asherah. And I'm saying, abandon all that and turn back to, to, uh, to Yahweh, to the Lord their God. So he was talking about that idea of turning hearts to the people back to God. We see the same well, with John the Baptist. We see uh, that as he went into the wilderness, he was a voice crying in the wilderness, and he said, repent, uh, for the kingdom of God uh, is at hand. Repent, because Jesus is coming. Repent. And what does repent mean? Repent basically means you're heading one way, and you turn back and head the other way. It's not the same as confessing your sin. You can confess, yes, I sinned today, uh, and you sin, but you don't change. You don't turn. But repentance has the idea of not only confessing, but also turning. And so we see that with John the Baptist. Um, And Elijah will come once again, the spirit and the power of Elijah that was on John the Baptist before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. And the purpose of that will be to turn the hearts of the people uh, to Christ in preparation for Jesus' second uh, coming. This, this is a, you know, you, you, when you first hear this, you think, well, that's, what's the big deal there? Everybody, every Christian's already turned to Christ, and I want to say absolutely not. Not what God's saying. No, the Lord is saying there is a, ma- listen to me now, that there is a major issue in the global church where people are pursuing Many things, uh, and most of those things, <coughs> excuse me, most of those things would be in the realm, in the arena of the Christian perspective or the Christian expression. But they are pursuing many things other than Christ. And what the forerunners are to do is to turn people back to God, back to Christ. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. Once you see it, you'll see it everywhere you turn. You'll see it on Christian TV. You'll see it on uh, YouTube messages. You'll see it uh, in just things you hear from other churches or around the world. You, you'll hear it from your friends. And this, he had this message. He had this uh, teaching. And you'll see how the focus is on uh, turning people uh, back to the Lord. Uh, are there on other things other than turning people back to the Lord. So here's what we want to do now. I want to, li- I want to list five different ways that people are turned back to God, to God or to Christ. Um, this is in your notes, and we'll go through it, but I want you to really get these things. How, how do we turn people back to, to God? How do we do it? What do we do? Five things, five aspects of turning people back to the Lord their God, back to Christ. First one is to turn people uh, back to the person 
of Christ. Turn people back to the person uh, of Christ. That's what John was doing in his day. There, were, there was all sorts of uh, things that were going on in, the, in that day in the religious community, and we'll talk more about that in the next session, uh, that were going on in, in, in his day in the religious community. But a lot of that was focused on religion and things of God, but not on the person of Christ. Um, if you'll notice one scripture that the Apostle John wrote, not John the Baptist, but the Apostle John wrote in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. And John, as well as Andrew and, and maybe some other of the disciples of Jesus' apostles, were originally disciples of John the Baptist. John was certainly one of those that was this. And you remember how John the Baptist said, you brood of vipers, you know, come and do works of, uh, at fruit and, and, and uh, to show your repentance. Well, here's what John wrote and spoke, uh, that Je John wrote that Jesus spoke uh, to the religious community of the day, the Pharisees, the religious community. He said this, John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You think in the, in the scripture. Now, when he was talking about that, they were talking about the Old Testament law, the scriptures, and even all that they had added to the scriptures in addition to the, the law that was written actually in the Old Testament uh, books of the Old Testament. He said, you think that's where eternal life is. But he, he, here's what Jesus said. It is these that testify about me. From Genesis to Revelation, the theme and the message of the scriptures is this man, Christ Jesus. He is the preeminent uh, one. And he said, you... It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Uh, the religious community that Jesus dealt with was looking for the life of God in things other than in this man, Christ. Uh, it's, and it was a, it's a major issue. It, it was a major issue then. Uh, it is a major issue now. People are looking for... The people are looking for life, spiritual life, in things other than Christ. You know, we see some of this, like uh, in the times of John the Baptist, they were, they were focused on externals. Just think about what they were doing. They, were, they had the law, which was an external rule-keeping system. They had added a lot more to the law to explain how to keep these rules. So it was all an external focus. Uh, we see with Elijah, uh, like the sins of Jeroboam were in the, were in the land, there was compromise, and there was, uh, that's, the sins of Jeroboam are, are pretty much compromise and self-promotion. Um, in the uh, in time of Elijah, there was false worship with Baal and Asherah worship. Um, and that's what's happening today. People are focused either on totally on false worship or even in the realm of the church, even in the realm of the global church, there's a lot of compromise, there's a lot of self-promotion, uh, doing things to exalt the leader rather than to prepare the people. There is, there's a focus on externals, uh, things like recuperating or restoring the Jewish uh, Hebraic roots and where the focus is on in start re, 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 um, capturing the law, the feast, and all the different things there on signs and wonders, externals, and ministries like that. All of those things are, are, are there, and the church is involved in those things. But the Lord is trying, before he does anything else, I believe the main thing that he wants to do in this hour, in this time, is to bring people back to Christ, to the person of Christ. Not all this external uh, uh, things that are going on uh, around the world. Jesus said, if you uh, are, are burdened, heavy laden, come to me. He didn't say come to the scriptures. He didn't say come to the law. He didn't say come to the feasts. He didn't say come to any of these things. He said, come to me, to the person of Christ. Uh, and that's one major, major, and probably the predominant 
objective of the forerunner call is to turn people, uh, if they're not saved, to turn them first to Christ. But if they are a believer and they're focused on so many externals, uh, and you, you begin to see this, and you'll see it everywhere. It's all over the place. Subtle in some places, not so subtle in others. Where they're focused on aspects of church life or Christian life, but not on Christ, on the, on the person of Christ and a personal relationship with him. A personal relationship um, growing in intimacy, in union, in image, and conformed into the image of this man, Christ. So that's the first way that a forerunner needs to turn people back to Christ, is to turn them back to Christ, to the person uh, of Christ. Now, the second way, uh, still basically turn, turning people back to Christ, is that forerunners should also turn people to God's eternal purpose, to, their, to God's eternal purpose purpose. Uh, in our life school class that will be part of the Forerunner School call it, called the Eternal Blueprint, uh, there are five, we, we list five uh, aspects of eternal purpose, five aspects of eternal purpose. And forerunners, as they are turning people back to Christ, need to turn them back to these five things because this is an aspect of turning people back to the person of Jesus Christ. And let me just run through them quickly. We'll go into a lot of detail uh, in that class on the eternal blueprint on these, but we don't want to try to reteach that here. Uh, but there, there are five aspects of it. First one of eternal purpose is that Christ is preeminent and he's at the center of everything. And you can see that in a lot of places. You can see it in Colossians. The book of Colossians is really powerful in that it talks about bringing people out of all other things back to this man, Christ Jesus. Uh, it, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ is the preeminent one. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's not all this other stuff. It's not the types and the shadows or the elementary principles or any of those things. It's this person, Christ. And so Christ is at the center of it. Now, if you look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 10. The, the Ephesians is the book where the eternal purpose is, is laid out uh, very as clearly as any other book in the scriptures. And if you look at chapter 1, verse 10, chapter 1 of Ephesians is really the eternal purpose chapter even. It summarizes it in a sense of saying that the goal of, of life of, is to unite Heaven and earth, every created thing, every person who was, is, and will ever be born in this man Christ, to give him preeminence, to give him, uh, to exalt him. And this will never end. This will never end. Forever and ever and ever, this man Christ will be the center, the preeminent one of all of creation. He'll be joining heaven and earth and whatever all that means into this person of Christ. And so that's the first aspect of God's eternal purpose is to draw people back to the preeminent one. And in a sense, that is the same as the other point that I had, but there's other aspects of it. The second part of these five aspects of God's eternal purpose is that uh, God's plan from eternity past is for the Father to have a family of Christ like sons. A, fa a family of Christ-like sons, mature sons that, are, that have taken on the image of Christ, where he is the firstborn among many brethren, that we're joint heirs with Christ. And, but that comes out of a maturity uh, of that. And so, you know, if you look at that, just that one thing, how little focus globally on the church there is other than that aspect of creating this family for, for the father of mature sons. And they'll be eternal. These will be eternal representatives in partnership with this man Christ forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, never to cease as God forever expands his kingdom. We'll look at that in just a second. Uh, but that's the purpose. That's, that's, 
that's a, a primary aspect of God's eternal purpose for the church age. And so what do forerunners have to do? Forerunners have to speak to people who are in these other things, who are, who are doing all these other uh, peripheral things within the church life or within the, the body of Christ and bring them back to the main thing is to exalt this man Christ and to raise up a people who become mature sons uh, for as a part of the family for the father. Uh, and you, you can see as well as I can how little of this is actually really being emphasized in the church uh, today. Uh, in a similar way, the third aspect of God's eternal purpose uh, is to have for Christ to have an equally yoked bride. An equally yoked bride. Now, we'll talk about this, and there's a class on the bride. The, the eternal blueprint has a, a chapter on the bride. There's a lot to say about the bride, but basically is it's this, that when we are born again, when a believer is born again, they become the betrothed bride of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 talks about that. They become that betrothed bride, and they have their life. We have our life to make ourselves ready. For the wedding, to be the eternal wife of the Lamb, to be ready to be at that bride without spot or wrinkle, uh, blameless and holy. Uh, we have our life to, to, to be prepared for that. And that bride will be used uh, in partnership as the eternal wife of the Lamb to be used forever and ever and ever as God expands his kingdom in partnership with Christ. Uh, and so it's a major, major dynamic in the church. Remember, John the Baptist was called a friend of the bridegroom. He was a friend of the bridegroom to make ready a bride for Jesus. And so it's a, it's a major aspect of the forerunner call is to prepare this bride. How many churches never even mention the bride? They're focused on so many other things, but God is raising up forerunners who will have this burning in their heart to raise up a prepared bride, a worthy bride. For Christ. So we see that as the third thing. The fourth thing is that the Holy Spirit will have a temple, a house, and a body in which he can inhabit, and this will be uh, forever. Uh, to place the Spirit of his Son into a unique creation uh, who will indwell with full possession of that body. To let Christ, the, the Spirit of the living God, take over our soul, take over our mind, our will, our emotion, our, the cravings of our body, our actions, all of these things, to take over our heart. Uh, again, how little emphasis is given uh, to that. And then the fifth uh, dimension of this uh, is that God's eternal purpose is that believers are invited to receive an inheritance of eternal intimacy with the Godhead, eternal authority throughout the ages, and eternal glory, eternal intimacy, authority, and glory. And we'll talk about this a little bit later uh, in the next session, I believe. But the, we'll be evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. And we will, the degree of intimacy, the degree of authority, and the degree of, degree of glory we have upon us will be determined uh, by our life this, in this life. Now, forerunners are to make people aware of that. I mean, how many messages do you ever hear about the judgment seat of Christ and eternity and all that? Not much other than getting saved. So, the forerunners are to turn people back first to the person of Christ, second to God's eternal purpose, which includes those five aspects or five dimensions. Now, there's a third way that we, that we turn people back to God. And that's forerunners, uh, this is the third one, forerunners turn people from the focus on external things of God, the external things of God, to an internal kingdom. From the external, fo focus on the external things of God. I'm not talking about movies and ball games and those kind of externals. I'm talking about external things of God back to the internal kingdom. Uh, Let's look at uh, let's look at this um, Luke seven Luke seventeen twenty and twenty one. Let me just read this verse. 
Now, this is Jesus speaking. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and he said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. You know, you're not going to be able to see it uh, with externals. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. That's what Jesus said. It's within you. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. This is in the New King James Version. Now, if you read it in the New American Standard Version, it will say the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, probably both of those meanings are applicable in the context of that scripture. To the Pharisees... Uh, and who, to, who, to whom Jesus was talking, the kingdom was in their midst. They were looking for an external deliverer to come and deliver them from the Roman oppression. And he's saying, it ain't going to happen that way. It's in your midst right now. I, I'm, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm in it. That's what Jesus was saying. Uh, I'm the kingdom. But to those who would be believers, he would make this point. The kingdom of God uh, is within you. It's an internal kingdom. Uh, the kingdom, you know, we have to advance the kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom to come starts with us internally. You know, when we're born again, our spirit is made righteous. Our spirit is justified. <coughs> the kingdom of God comes uh, and dwells within us, and it abides in our spirit. But the journey of the kingdom to, for the kingdom to expand starts with us, from our spirit to our, our soul, to our self-life, uh, to our mind, our will, our emotions, our actions. So it's an internal kingdom. And this is a major function of forerunners in this hour is to turn people away from trying to build an external kingdom and into an internal, to build an internal kingdom. Just think about the focus that's on, on the church right now, the global, the global church. There, uh, the focus is a lot of them is on building a large church, building a, a, just a lot of people. But that's building the kingdom. If you can have 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 people in attendance, boy, you've built the kingdom. But see, that it totally ignores the internal kingdom. This focus is on signs and wonders. Uh, it's a, that's a major issue in much of the church, especially when you get into some of these third world countries. We, we do a lot of work in Africa, and you see in Africa that, that there's a huge emphasis on signs and wonders uh, to try to minister signs and wonders. But the main reason for it is not so much to get people uh, healed and delivered. It's to build up a church, to build up an external kingdom of a church. Uh, a lot of work on restore, a lot of emphasis on his restoring Hebraic roots. Well, the foundation of the world was before there was a Jew, before there was a Hebraic root to, to restore. And so God's not trying to restore the law. He's not trying to get people to build a tabernacle in their backyard, a tent in their backyard for the Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, if you want to do those things, it's okay. But the purpose of it is not those things. It's, to, it's an internal kingdom or some to build all these service ministries and different kind of aspects of it. Uh, all that's going to be burned up unless God's initiated it. And what God is wanting to do is to, is to bring the church from the external focus back to the internal kingdom where Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. Christ in a people in fullness is the hope of glory. And so forerunner, this is a major task of forerunners in this hour. Um, and I'll tell you just from experience, we, we've, had, we've dealt with this some as we've gone to Africa and dealt with some of our leaders. And as you confront this kind of thing, uh, uh, they were very eager and willing to, to, to change, but, they, but it showed us the magnitude of this problem uh, in, in really around the world. And so it's a major aspect of the forerunner call. Now, the fourth uh, way that forerunners turn the hearts of, of people back to Christ is the, this is also listed in that uh, same passage, uh, of turning the hearts of the leaders to their spiritual children. 
You know, in Luke chapter 117, it said, turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Now, that may be talking to, about uh, natural children. I mean, certainly that's one important dynamic. Fathers need to have a heart for their children and not a heart for themselves. Uh, and you see, when, when you see that a lot in the in the community when fathers are not there, when they're uh, not interested in their children. You see how uh, how damaged that the children can be. So there's a there's certainly an ap application there, but really what I believe the Lord's talking primarily about here, or just as much anyway, is to turn the hearts of the, of spiritual leaders to their spiritual children. This is a huge issue, uh, maybe not quite as much in America as it is in some of the other places uh, that we've ministered, but I think it's a huge issue in America as well, is that the leaders, a lot of times, the leaders are in it for themselves. The leaders are, are in it for their own self-glorification, uh, their self-exaltation, uh, they feel like, okay, if I can have a, a big ministry, then I'll be honored. I'll be favored. I'll be prosperous. I'll be all of these things. And so and sometimes it's even it's so subtle. I mean, we all, as, as leaders, probably have fallen into this trap at some point and in some way to build ourselves up. But who's the victim in this? The victim is the children, the spiritual children, because the more we try to, to focus and do things to build leadership up, what happens? The children are neglected. They become a pawn uh, or a piece of equipment in our ministry to build our ministry up. And we could, care, you know, a lot of times people could care less about what's happening in the hearts and the lives of the people. And so this is another aspect of the forerunner call is to turn the hearts of, of leaders, fathers to their children naturally, but also spiritual leaders back to the children, back to spiritual children. And we'll talk really in, um, we'll talk about, I think it's the next session, we'll talk about uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. The role of the fivefold ministry. We'll talk about that. But the role of the fivefold ministry is not to be this man of God that everybody gets. Oh wow, this is the man of God. It's not that. It's to equip a people to become that mature man. So here's a scripture verse uh, that I think characterizes a lot in the church globally. It's from Ezekiel chapter 34, talking about shepherds. He says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and close yourself with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The disease you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost, but with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and, the, and they became food for every beast of the field, and they were scattered. That's the, that's the prophecy against the false shepherds. But the Lord in this hour wants to raise up shepherds after his own heart, shepherds who will who will build up the body. Uh, and so that's one of the roles of the forerunner is to turn the hearts of the leaders back to the people, away from this false shepherding kind of idea. Now, the fifth one, this is the, the, the last one, of the ways that forerunners turn people back to Christ. Forerunners turn the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. Again, that's in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, the very end of the phrase. Turn in the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is another aspect of it. Um, if you read, in fact, let's, let me turn to, I'll turn to this scripture. Um, Revelation 19, 7. This is right as the Lord's getting ready to return uh, the bride has made herself ready. 
Here's what it reads. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride or wife has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, listen to this, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. In other words, the bride was given the assignment to clothe herself with righteous acts. Now, if you first hear that, your initial thought is that I got to go do works of righteousness. I got to go serve in the food pantry. I've got to uh, you go do this or go do that, do works, righteous works. Well, that's not really the meaning of that uh, verse there. In fact, the righteous acts is really just one word in the Greek, which, which would really be better translated as righteousness. And so the bride has to make herself ready by, over time, clothing herself in righteousness, um, you know, when we come to the Lord, every one of us, when we come to the Lord, some more deep in sin than others, but we come and we have, we're, we have filthy garments on of, of sin and shame and all sorts of things, and we're justified, and our spirit becomes righteous uh, immediately at the point of salvation, but our soul, our self-life, and, and our actions and all that don't become righteous immediately. That, that's the process of sanctification that makes us uh, this way. And so we're all disobedient uh, when we come to the Lord. And what God's goal is, is to over time, is to clothe us with internal righteousness, not only in our spirit, which is made righteous when we're born again, but also in our soul, in all, in, where our thoughts, our actions, our choices our emotions and uh, all of the different things, the places we walk, the, what we do, all of that uh, is, is made righteous. And when the bride is made ready, when she has been clothed with this righteousness. So this is part of the forerunner call, is to turn the disobedient, those areas of unrighteousness, into righteousness. Now, only God can do that, and only God can do that in the heart and the life of an individual believer. But Forerunner's goal is to be a voice, to make that aware, to make people aware of that issue, to make people aware of things, uh, even detail things, not so much detail in their own life. I'm not saying we need to say, hey, I see a spirit of adultery over you or something like that. N nothing like that, but I'm talking about being a voice to highlight different things that we might be ignorant of uh, as the Lord brings them to our attention and convicts us of these things in our own life. So that's a major role of the forerunner, to, to turn people back to God, is turning them back from disobedience back to the righteousness of Christ so that God will have his family of mature sons and, the, and Christ will have that mature Bride and the and the Holy Spirit will have that temple indwelling in Christ, indwelling us in fullness, and the the man Christ might be exalted and have eternal partners to be his partner forever and ever and ever and ever. And so, this is what you know what we're doing. Just kind of bring this session to a close. We're talking. We're we're trying to dissect. Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, and this whole session is been about verse 16, about uh, turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Uh, and that's, what we, that's a major aspect, uh, probably the, that, that's the objective, really, of the forerunner call, is to turn people back to God, turn them back to Christ, turn them back to his eternal purpose, uh, uh, turning the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, turning the uh, from the in external to the internal, and, and turning uh, leaders back to the people. As we do those five things, we'll be turning people back to the Lord to exalt this man Christ, and that's the call of the forerunner. That's the that's the objective of it. I mean, there's a lot of other aspects to it and details of it, but that's our role. And a lot of it is to the church. A lot of it is the call to the church. 
to, church, to turn people in who are believers in the church, whether it's leaders or followers or believers, turn them back to this man, Christ Jesus. Uh, certainly to the world, as people come into the kingdom, we need to start them on the right path. Uh, and there's certainly an aspect of that. But a lot of the ministry of the forerunner call, at least right now, is to the church, to turn the church. God has a case against the global church, in my opinion. Uh, and we're not exempt from it. I'm not saying that we've got it all right, uh, and nobody, and, but nobody else does. It's all of us. He's unveiling a new thing for a new time. It's not a new thing in terms of not being in the scriptures. It's been in the scriptures all the time. But it's a, it's a call to turn back to this man Christ. It's the foundation for everything that forerunners will do. And so my desire is to see us as we try to understand the forerunner call, really grasp this session. Turning Our call is to turn people back to Christ. Uh, it's not just something so I can carry, I say I'm anointed with the spirit and the power of Elijah. We'll talk about that in a couple of sessions but in the future. But um, it's not that. It's to turn people back to this man, Christ Jesus. So let's just pray. Father, we sense your presence on this and we say, Lord, make us, first make us ready as people who have turned who are and have turning back to this man Christ and all these five things that we talked about. Convict us where we are wrong, convict us where we have sinned, convict us where we're deceived or where we're blind or where we're in error. Make us ready and then raise us up as a voice that we might be a forerunner voice, even if it's one crying in the wilderness to a people. Turn back to the Lord your God. So we pray this. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen.